All right, so we're going to start on module four. Okay, module four. So we're going to start with chapter 23, which is going to be uh, integumentary function. So chapter 23. Okay, so again, as you know, uh, the first slide you'll see after the cover slide is going to be the learning objectives. And then after that, fortunately, this chapter does have, um, actually, no, I didn't add it into this, but it does have the, that really great uh, picture. So take a look at that on page 488. All right, so introduction. So the, the skin is gonna be the largest, largest organ in the body. Um, it is the most visible indicator of the effects, the combined effects of aging, lifestyle, um, and environment over a person's lifetime. So it is responsible for many different processes, including thermoregulation, excretion of metabolic waste, synthesis of vitamin D, maintaining electrolyte and fluid balance, and it also uh, helps us to sense pain, touch, pressure, temperature, vibration. It's also considered a social function. It can reflect different things about us um, as far as age, gender, personality. It can also indicate someone's race or gender and work status. I often get questions about that. So, um, you know, you could tell if someone worked outside a lot often by um, what their skin looks like from being exposed to the sun or uh, someone who works in dirt or grease, you can tell by their hands, they begin uh, to become stained over, over time. So age-related changes, we go over these changes every chapter. So as far as the skin is concerned, um, the whole system, the integumentary system includes the skin, the hair, the nails, and the sweat glands. So the skin has three layers, the epidermis, epi meaning top, dermis is the next layer, and then the sub, the sub Q is gonna be the bottom. So the epidermis is the barrier, um, it's on the outside, so it is going to prevent loss of fluid, prevent um, substances from entering um, into the tissues. As we age, these cells be begin to um, enlarge in, they become more um, variable in the shape, and the rate that they turn over or replace themselves is going to decrease. So melanocytes are what give skin their color. Uh, it does protect us against UV radiation. After age 25, we have a loss of, um, of melanocytes by 18 to 20% for every year, so every decade. So um, think about that. After age 25, if you live another 75 years and every decade you're losing 18 to 20%, within five years, we've lost almost all of it. So our moisture content decreases. The papilla is what gives the skin its texture. As we age, it retracts, causing a flattening, um, which starts to slow the transfer of nutrients and oxygen um, from going between layers. So then we have the dermis. Its primary function is going to be to regulate temperature, perceive um, sensory, and, uh, sensory information, and then nourish all of the layers. It's in the middle, so it's gonna be nourishing the layer above and the layer below like a sandwich. In early adulthood, we, we have a lot of age-related changes. Um, so the dermal thickness is gonna be diminished. Uh, elastin increases in quantity, so we have a lot more of it, but the quality is not very good. The dermal vascular bed um, decreases. The fibroblasts, which are the building, the blasts, and the mast cells decrease, so not as many. And we have atrophy of the hair bulbs and the sweat and sebaceous glands. More age-related changes as far as the sub-Q and the cutaneous nerves. Um, so that's gonna be the inner layer of fat and that protects against the underlying tissues. It stores calories, it helps insulate and regulates us from losing heat. As we age, we have atrophy of that tissue or we have hypertrophy of the subcutaneous tissue. Um, so age-related changes are also gonna affect the cutaneous nerves and they are responsible for sensing pressure, vibration, and light touch. Um, so we have a decrease in sensation for pain and discomfort as well. 
and which is going to increase our wound healing time. So, you know, one of those functional consequences. Um, so an 80 year old is going to take twice as long for us to heal as a 30 year old would take. And we'll go over that um, a little bit later. So your sweat and sebaceous glands. So we have eccrine and apocrine respectively. So they originate in that dermal layer and they're really going to be most abundant in the palms of your hands, um, the soles of your feet, and then in your axilla. So eccrine, which are really the ones that are more important for thermoregulation, they actually open directly onto the skin. The apocrine are larger and they open into the hair follicles and they're primarily in the axilla and the genital area. And their sole function is to produce secretions and they both are gonna decrease in the number and the ability to function as we get older. Um, as far as nails, so nail growth is influenced by lots of different factors, including how well you are um, from a health perspective. So the growth is going to slow early in adulthood, and we have a 30 to 50% overall decrease in our nail growth. They become thinner, they become more fragile and brittle. As far as hair, so color and distribution in older adults um, is going to be varied to some degree. We, we can have graying and thinning. Um, women have, unfortunately, more hair growth to their face and their upper lip in places that you would never imagine that you hadn't seen it before. Um, and then men are going to have that growth to their ears. Um, you can see men as they get older, they have, you know, fuzzy ears. Um, they have it coming out of their nose. They have eyebrows that look really crazy. Um, and then we have a loss of body hair for both men and women um, in the axilla and the pubic area. So I guess that's a good thing. So risk factors, risk factors are going to include, so heredity, that plays a really big role in skin and hair changes, though some people are just naturally higher to um, have a higher sensitivity to UV rays. I'm very um, pale skinned um, and I, you know, burn very easily, so I have to be very careful and that's my whole family's that way. So um, lifestyle and environmental factors, it's more of a cumulative effect um, that we really start to notice when, as people get older. Unfortunately, there's not really much you can do about it um, at that point. So things like, um, you know, smoking and laying out in the sun or being exposed to pollution, um, secondhand smoke, alcohol, all those things we've talked about in a couple of the other chapters already. Those are all risk factors that we can prevent at, when we're younger and, you know, promote that teaching in our patients before it becomes a problem. Adverse medication effects. So there's a lot of common reactions that the skin has um, to medication, uh, pruritus, rashes, you can have photosensitivity. There are some less common um, reactions, including alopecia, which would be when all your hair falls out, um, and then different types of uh, problems with pigmentation. Also aspirin, NSAIDs, um, sulfamethoxazole, metformin, a couple of those other drugs can all um, cause issues with the skin. And nutritional uh, deficiency. So it does increase the risk for those other pathological conditions, alopecia being one of them, dermatitis. Sociocultural influences. So people in higher industrialized areas, which would be the United States, um, tend to place a higher value on hygiene and um, more expensive sometimes in specialized skincare practices. Um, but it, studies do show that you know, frequently bathing with a lot of these soaps that tend to be harsher can cause a lot of skin issues for older adults. So we do want to be careful when, whenever we're putting anything on older adult skin, including sunscreen, um, which I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So functional consequences. So delayed wound healing, as I mentioned. So regeneration of healthy skin for an 80 year old is going to take twice as long for someone who's 30. And these consequences you know, put them at a huge risk for um, disruption of wounds after someone's had surgery, um, delaying of, of what could be a really, really minor wound, and um, puts them at risk for then developing those secondary infections. Photo aging, so that is going to be, um, you know, someone who's been out in the sun a lot, um, those skin changes that occur due to that UV radiation. You don't ever have to have had a detectable sunburn to have photo aging. Um, most people assume that it is a normal uh, effect of aging, but it, it's, it definitely is not. It occurs independently of aging and 
It's not something we see until later. So while we tend to see it later, it doesn't mean it's something that should be happening. Comfort and sensation, so age-related changes such as um, decreased output of sebum, sebum and the eccrine uh, sweat contributes to a uh, decrease in the content of moisture that's in the skin. Dry skin is a huge complaint for older adults. Um, they say about 85, sometimes more percent of people report that they have that. Um, and around age 80, our tactile sensitivity begins to decline and we have um, less sensations of, it, of feeling as though your skin is dry, it tears very easily. And uh, thermoregulation is also affected. Cosmetic effects, so overall the skin appear, appears more pale as we get older, almost translucent, translucent, almost see-through. It's like almost like crepe paper. Um, pigmentation spots all over. Um, and that is really caused by a decrease in the melanocytes and a decrease in the circulation within the dermis. Um, and then these changes can lead to uh, sagging and wrinkling, which most of us will probably experience. So pathological conditions, um, so skin cancer being one of the most um, prevalent, um, serious functional consequences of, of age-related skin changes. Skin tears, this can be caused by shear, um, friction, or blunt force. So shear is when you have opposing forces of skin, which damages the underlying tissues. So a good explanation would be if you are in a hospital bed and you're wearing a gown and you have, um, you know, when you're on a bed and you're in a hospital bed and your back is almost stuck to the bed, depending on what kind of um, covering they put on it. So if you pulled somebody or pushed somebody and their bed was still stuck to that, you would have an opposition um, in the force of the skin. So the skin would be going in one direction and you would be pulling in a different direction. So that actually damages the underlying tissues. Um, and that's huge for, for those um, older adults who are, are bedridden, um, you know, or in, are dependent on people for assistance. So again, it causes separation of the skin layers. Uh, the most prevalent risk factor is older age. Um, it can also um, account for mobility issues, falls, um, cognitive impairment, and any time that someone needs assistance, as I just mentioned. So as you can see, they all describe people as they get older. Um, they are associated with significant functional consequences, pain, functional impairment, lots of stays in the hospital, long-term care stays. I've, I've seen wounds, of course, some that never ever heal, but wounds that are very, very small that can take years to heal. Um, so we have a couple different types of um, skin tear. So we have type one, type two, and type three. So type one would be no skin loss. So the skin tears, um, and we're able to stair strip it back down. You end up with just the crescent or whatever the shape is of the tear, but there's no skin loss. Type two, sometimes you lose a piece of that flap. So you go to put it back on, and most of the time, it lay, if, it, if it's intact, it, you can lay it down almost perfectly like a, like a blanket and cover it right up. But if it had partial flap loss, you may have some of the flap and you may not have the rest of it. So now we're open. We can also have type three, which is total flap loss. So it comes off and I've had it happen. We don't even know where it went and it could be the biggest flap you've ever seen. So one, two, and three. So pressure injury, um, you know, most commonly people know them as bed sores or pressure sores. I see a lot of commercials about, you know, lawyers trying to get people to call them if their loved one has experienced this. So essentially it's just damage to the skin, um, sometimes the underlying soft tissue usually over a bony prominence. Um, it can be under some type of device. Um, I've seen it on the back of the head. I've seen it on the ears. I've seen them um, all, all places that, you know, usually the head and the back of the ears are not as common, but I've seen them everywhere. Um, so it's usually resu resulting from intense um, and or um, prolonged pressure or pressure in combination with shear, as I mentioned earlier. Most commonly, you're going to see it on the sacrum or the heel. Um, and the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel is the organization that governs what the staging and the terminology is. They change every so often. Uh, since I've been practicing, I've probably seen them change, um, I would say, two or three times. So 
Um, and let's see, I have a page listed on the bottom here, 23-2, page 494 and 495. Yeah, so we have all the different stages on here that you can see and all the different parts of the body. Um, it's always interesting to look at, you know, if someone's laying on their stomach or someone's laying on their side, you won't often see somebody, an older adult laying on their stomach that way. But if you think about it in a wheelchair, there's all these different areas that um, you don't even think of. So like those ischial tuberosity that you can see, that would be almost the side of your legs um, where your hip meets the top of your leg. And that is from being in a wheelchair. You wouldn't even think of it, but when someone's in a wheelchair, if the wheelchair is not sized correctly and um, they are a little bit too big for the wheelchair or they've gained weight over time, a lot of pressure comes right there. And you once once it's there, you're not getting rid of it. So. Um, it's always important to picture um, the position that people are in and, and what could put them at most risk. So as you can see from here, we have stage one, stage two, and stage three, and stage four. Okay, so stage one would be not open. So the easiest way to remember it is stage one is not open. Stage two, we're open. So the skin is open. It can be a blister. Blister is always uh, categorized as the stage two. Stage three um, is when it extends into the tissue. So it could be in the sub -Q, um, which is the pink tissue, but it's not going to be in the muscle. It's not going to be in the tendon. It's not going to be in the bone. Stage four is going to be deep. It's going to be into the muscle. It's going to be into the bone. So one, of course, not open. Four, as deep as it possibly can be. And then if you remember two and three, um, it should help you remember if you think about the dermis and, and the epidermis and all that. So, all right. So when we say the words blanchable, blanchable means white and pale when you're pressing on it. But as soon as you let it go, as soon as you let the skin go, the color returns to normal. So if you take your hand, your finger and press on your arm right now, and you take your finger off, you can see, you can see your finger imprint for just a second, but then it comes right back and your skin looks the same. Non-blanchable is when the redness persists. So it's still there. That's when you know you have damage. So a pressure injury is gonna be localized damage to the skin and underlying soft tissue. And it's again, usually over the bony prominence or under some type of device. So the staging is used to classify the extent of the damage. So once we stage it and I, once we identify it and stage it, we need to obviously frequently reassess it. But most commonly we're reassessing it weekly. You wanna do it more often, that's fine. But in long-term care facilities, um, the staging um, as far as identification and reassessment for purposes of the treatment that you're using is going to be done weekly. A wound report is compiled by the wound nurse. Um, I was a wound nurse for years um, and every week we go around measure everybody. So if I am, if I have a treatment on somebody and after two weeks um, I have seen that their um, wound has improved by 50%, so it's half improved, then I'm going to keep continuing with that treatment. But you, you got to give treatments time. You can't do it for a couple days. Sometimes they, they get worse. They start to look yucky after uh, even two, three days. You have to give it time. Um, you know, there's going to be times where you're going to know right away this does not look good. But for testing purposes, I want you to remember that we're going to assess them weekly. And if after two weeks, you know, they're better than 50% or 50% um, improved, then we're going to keep going with what we're doing because it's obviously working. So we do not reverse stage, we used to do this. So let's say I have a stage three and next month I am down to a stage two. I am not a stage two, I'm still a stage three. So I could have measurements as a stage two, I could look like a stage two. You can write your note, everything could look like a stage two. And even when it's healed, I still had a resolved stage three. We used to, fluctuate between stages. So I'm a stage three and then you get me down to a two and you get me to one. It's like it never happened. We don't do that anymore. Um, that changed about five years ago. Um, so the major initiatives are going to be obviously to identify this um, once it happens, but even before that is to prevent it. And it is a core measure of safety and quality of all organizations, no matter where you are. They could be called different things, but they're all, everyone's looking for this. Um, because guess what? If you get a patient from a hospital and you're in a um, long-term care facility and they have a wound and you don't notice it when you admit that person and tomorrow you see a wound, guess what? It's yours. Even if it was there, even if it's the biggest wound you've ever seen and no one noticed it, 
Someone didn't take off a bandage. Someone didn't take off a sock. That becomes your wound. You own all the costs of what it takes to treat that wound, even if it takes three years and $100,000. So um, it's very, very important to always be monitoring for this. As you can imagine, the functional consequences, pain, loss of function, decreased quality of life. Um, risk identification is going to be the main focus of nursing care. If you're a nurse and you identify an area um, and you see this discoloration while you're performing an assessment, you need to further assess that. You need to document, you need to get a treatment in place. It cannot wait. Um, the Braden scale. So that's going to be on 497. And that is uh, a scale to choose for predicting pressure sore risk. And you'll see that again in all facilities. It's it's widely used. It's I don't know of any other. So um, so I want you to pay attention to the number. So 19 to 23 is no risk. Um, 15 to 18 would put you at mild risk. So if you see somebody and you are doing this scale and you know they're in um, the top, the top number, so 19 to 23, we don't have to put anything in place. Once we get to that next level, that 15 to 18, we're at mild risk. Now is when we're going to need to implement some type of program. Are we going to turn and reposition frequently? Are we going to do skin checks um, frequently? Um, are we going to, you know, if they have a treatment, we would obviously want to medicate them prior to the treatment. And, you know, if they had a treatment in place already, we would be turning and repositioning every one to two hours. But if you didn't, if you didn't um, have any wounds and you were predicting that they could be at risk, that 15 to 18 is going to be where you have to, you have to implement something. You can't just get the number and put it in the computer or wherever and just keep moving along. Okay. So nursing assessment, you need to identify opportunities for health promotion. So when you're doing your assessment questions, um, you want to identify their perception of the problem. What are their risk factors? What are their personal care behaviors? Um, and, and what can um, these behaviors do to influence their hair, their skin, and, and their nail status? Gathering information about what medications they're taking, any kind of risk factors as far as medications, any kind of information you can gather about uh, their fluid intake, their nutritional status, how they're moving, like I mentioned about the, the wheelchair. Those are the things you need to look for um, as far as the skin is concerned. This is when you get into really thinking outside of basic nursing and moving into critical thinking and always planning ahead. You wanna observe the skin, the hair and the nails. Um, we're not just looking at major body systems. This is very, very important. Um, and if anything, this will be one thing that you would not want to miss and have come back and bite you later. Um, make sure when you're, in, you're you know, assessing somebody or inspecting them that it's warm, it's private, you can see really well, you don't want to miss anything. Um, checking the color, the turgor, um, and on an older adult, the best place to check turgor is not going to be the top of your hand. It's going to be the abdomen. Um, what is their overall condition? Do they have any bruises? What did the growths look like? It can be confusing as a newer nurse to identify different um, spots and things that look different on older adults because you can have so many. I mean, you can have warts and moles and um, all different types of areas of dryness and skin um, pigmentation. So do your best to describe it um, using, uh, you know, good verbiage. Um, let's see. So... Anytime you would see redness, swelling, dark pigmentation, um, moisture in an area, any kind of drainage, someone's in pain or discomfort when you touch something. If you see an area that is raised or the edges are irregular or you have crazy colors, blue, we wouldn't want to see anything that was blue. Um, those are things that need to be investigated and that is your responsibility. Pay attention to these clues that um, can lead you to understanding how someone's functioning from a physiologic perspective. So if someone had brown stained fingertips, it's often um, that they have been smoking. Um, when people get older, you'll see feces underneath people's fingernails. That's typically indicative of um, constipation. People tend to um, disimpact themselves. Um, although that sounds horrible, it does happen um, or they're, you know, not really able to help themselves. So like it could be an ADL thing as well, but most of the time when you see it, it's gonna be because they were constipated. Bruises, have they fallen? Um, are they being abused? Something to consider. Um, older adults present with different manifestations. So as I mentioned, this turgor is not always an indicator of, of hydration. You do wanna check that, um, that abdomen. 
And as I mentioned in the beginning, wound healing times are gonna be affected because of those age-related changes. So your nursing interventions. Number one teaching is gonna be skin wellness, and that is gonna be making sure that people limit their sun exposure. Um, you wanna promote healthy skin, maintain optimal nutrition and hydra uh, hydration, and again, promote those interventions. So that would be environmental factors, personal care practices, um, preventing wrinkles, you know, that once it's done, it's done. But when people are younger, we can teach them to avoid the sunlight, you know, using protective methods, um, but being cautious about what's in sunscreen because there is, um, there are chemicals in sunscreen that can affect people and that people are allergic to. Preventing dry skin. Um, so when, when we bathe older adults, we typically like to apply um, an emollient um, and they are often um, applied when someone is still moist after bathing so that they can uh, soak into the skin um, while the skin is drying at the same time. So that's best applied at that point. Um, detecting these harmful lesions. So we know with um, A, B, C, D, E, we wanna look at asymmetry, border, color, um, all that just to make sure that we don't have any type of skin cancers. Early detection is gonna be key. Making sure that we teach people to increase fluids, always getting uh, increase uh, a really good intake of vitamin A and vitamin C. And in order to evaluate whether you were effective, they'll tell you that they, um, you know, felt that this was effective. Their skin remains intact. Their health uh, behaviors have increased or are being maintained and they're uh, maintaining effectiveness for these interventions that you put in place for the skin breakdown. All right, so next we're gonna move on to respiratory function. And I wanna say it's 21, it is. Okay, let me get out of here. Okay, chapter 21, and I feel like the PowerPoint says 19, but maybe, oh, yeah, it does. Okay, that's a mistake, and I will adjust that. All right, so again, we have the learning objectives on slide one. All right, so the two primary functions of respiration are going to be to supply oxygen to the body and then to remove the carbon dioxide from the body. Again, with the age-related changes, so we have upper um, airway structure and function changes, changes in connective tissue. We have diminished blood supply. So the diminished blood flow um, often to the nose um, causes us to have the smaller turbinates. Changes in mucus secretion, they become thicker, more difficult to move. We have a stiffened trachea, and that's related to calcification of cartilage. Um, we have a blunted cough and gag reflex, atrophy of the laryngeal nerve endings. Some more over here, uh, lung structure and function changes. So the lungs are smaller, they're flabbier. Uh, the alveoli become larger, but the walls are thinner. That usually begins around age 20 to 30 and then continues through adulthood. The pulmonary artery stiffens, becomes wider, thicker, less elastic. We have a decrease in the number of, number of capillaries. Our blood volume decreases. The um, mucosal bed thickens, which is where um, diffusion is occurring. So it's harder for that to, to occur. Changes in elastic recoil. So that results in early airway closure. Um, our ventilatory response is altered to both hypoxia and hypercapnia. Um, confusion or altered mental status instead of or in addition to dyspnea. Um, immune function is diminished, so we're more susceptible to infections such as pneumonia or other respiratory infections. Our T cell de numbers decrease, um, which unfortunately puts us at a diminished effectiveness for those vaccines, including the influenza vaccine. So risk factors, you're gonna see smoking again at the top. So 80% of all lung cancer deaths are related to tobacco use. Um, we end up with that shorter life expectancy. Pipes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, electronic e-cigarettes, all these vaping, all uh, vaping I'm not gonna include in this because we don't actually know what's gonna to happen to people that, that vape, um, we're not sure yet. So secondhand smoke, especially if you were exposed as a child while you were, you know, in those 
critical years. Other environmental factors, so that would be air pollutants, toxic substances. Most of those were prior to OSHA. We know a lot more than um, now than we did before. Um, so we're able to protect ourselves better. And then aspiration pneumonia. So risk factors, um, obesity, immobility, chronic illness, and some medications. So the functional consequences, unfortunately, now we're going to have a little bit more energy that's going to be expended for in order for us to breathe. Snoring and mouth breathing, diminished cough and gag reflex, um, diminished respiratory efficiency, gas exchange and lung volumes, um, and then those confounding symptoms when hypoxic that um, results in changes in mental status. We also have an increased susceptibility to lower respiratory infections, pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis. All right, so the pathological conditions. So on page 447, we have COPD. So COPD is a group of diseases that cause chronic airway um, obstruction and breathing issues. It is progressive um, and it's an increased inflammatory response to stimuli in the airway and the lungs. It also includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Um, again, it's characterized by chronic airflow obstruction. So the symptoms are gonna be cough, dyspnea, wheezing, um, and then this chronic increase in sputum. Diagnosis would be lung function tests, spirometry, and a good HMP. Treatment, slew and so many meds you couldn't even imagine for COPD. Um, sometimes they're taking three and four inhalers. Um, oxygen, um, unfortunately, it's around the clock when it gets closer to the end. Bronchodilator steroids are on that list. Um, rehabilitation and home care. Per slip breathing, which would be important for you to make sure that you teach prior to someone being discharged. Most of the time you're going to see somebody after they've already been diagnosed and they quickly figure out how to do this on their own. Um, oxygen at home. So they may or may not already have this if someone's being discharged. It really is hard to qualify and there is very specific criteria. Um, but if you're seeing someone in a, in a long-term care setting or an acute care setting, um, you would just put it on them. But just know when someone's discharged home, it is hard to get. Making sure that they're using their inhalers correctly. So your at-home teaching and plan of care prior to discharge would be, again, that purse lip breathing, making sure they understand how to do that, how to, how to use their inhalers, and then making sure that they understand that it's important to exercise as much as they can, although it will be challenging. Aspiration pneumonia. So it's a lung infection after aspiration of either food, liquids, uh, vomit, something like that. Um, risk factors, um, a history of dysphagia um, or an inability to clear, clear secretions um, or cough and deep breathe related to either a poor gag reflex, some reason that they have impaired swallowing, um, possibly a stroke. So manifestations, so those symptoms are going to be fever, cough, um, shortness of breath. They, get, they have this rattling, this noisy breathing that you can actually hear. Diagnosis is going to be based on clinical presentation, but also a chest x-ray can confirm that. And your treatment is going to be antibiotics and supportive care. Sometimes we'll use O2 depending on what's going on. And then um, steroids can also be effective short term. Tuberculosis is going to be a disease that's caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it is spread um, through air, airborne droplets. Risk factors are a weakened immune system, any type of chronic conditions, diabetes, kidney disease, um, HIV, AIDS, manifestations, uh, cough for three weeks with blood, um, chest pain, fatigue, weight loss, chills. Um, the treatment, they usually are taking several drugs at once for two, sometimes three years. Um, a couple of them are rifampin, um, fenbutal, um, isoniazid, a couple of them. So your nursing assessment, you're going to want to identify those opportunities to promote health, which is, you know, all that we, one of the main things that we're doing, identifying um, any type of risk, um, always using dyspnea as that sex vital sign in people with COPD. It is going to be your best friend when you're looking at how they're feeling and, and what is going on with them. You're going to want to make sure you're detecting if they have any lower respiratory infections, they are going to be more at risk. 
but making sure that you look for things that are normal. Um, you don't want to get confused with something that's a normal age-related change um, and thinking something else is wrong with them. So it would be normal um, in someone who's older to have a reduced intensity of breath sounds. So they're, you're no, they're not expanding um, and uh, exhaling as much as someone who was younger, but you wouldn't want to assume that there was something wrong with them. So you do need to be aware and you'll, you'll start to learn this of what is normal and what is not. Observe people's breathing, breathing pattern. You can tell a lot by looking at that. And then always asking about those past environmental exposures. You know, often that doesn't come up in conversation, but um, be aware that when someone does have those issues, you want to see if anything is really to cause for that. You will find most times there has been. So your nursing intervention is to prevent respiratory infections, protect them from smoking um, by always assessing if they are smoking or they're around people who are smoking. Anytime we can offer opportunities to promote wellness, um, the CDC and the American Cancer Society have really great um, information online. There are also really good um, cessation programs in the community. Nicotine patches can always be offered. So it's your responsibility to make sure you promote them. Um, your nursing interventions, preventing those lower respiratory infections, making sure we push vaccines, especially pneumonia and influenza vaccines on people who have um, lung issues already. If um, someone's in a nursing home, it is critical that they receive their flu vaccine um, and their pneumonia vaccines, um, especially if they have other diagnoses involved. Um, pneumonia, like I said, every five years. Um, you, you get your immunization once and then we do the boosters. Um, teaching prevention of those lower respiratory infections, um, you know, coughing, deep breathing, um, exercise, smoking cessation, and good oral hygiene can never be um, overlooked, you know, especially in, with those people who are at risk for aspiration pneumonia, um, pocketing food in their mouth or, um, you know, not swallowing things completely. If we can make sure we clean their mouth out as best as we can, it really can help. Evaluation. So, you know, they've demonstrated they demonstrated adequate immunization. They're telling you that they're feeling like they're breathing better. They, maybe they've stopped smoking or that they're able to verbalize to you um, that they know what those um, in, uh, infection strategies are, infection prevention strategies. All right, so chapter 26 is going to be sexual function. All right, so let's get into there. All right, and that's also gonna be in your Miller book. Again, that first page has the learning objectives. All right. Okay. So sexuality encompasses many different physiologic and psychosocial aspects. Um, it is important for quality of life, but unfortunately it is affected by age in so many ways. Often it's the attitudes of um, those around them that really um, affects their interest. Um, so age-related changes in women. It's important that you understand that menses ceases around the fifth decade, so around 50 years old. So pre-menopause would be when you're starting to develop those symptoms. Post-menopause, you have to have no period um, for 12 months. So if you haven't had it for 11 months and then you get it, you, your clock starts back over. You have to be period-free for 12 months. Those symptoms, hot flashes, vasomotor symptoms, those palpitations, um, weird skin chills, um, nausea, difficulty sleeping, vaginal dryness, atrophy of the reproductive organs, um, lack of estrogen affects so many different organs, the brain, the bone, the heart, the liver. Um, we can do estrogen therapy, but it does come with some significant risks. Um, we usually offer about three to four years of treatment, max of five. So, um, and then we try other things. Um, and then sometimes we give people a little bit of a break and we can come back to it again. We'll get into that in a little bit. Those age-related changes in men, so they have a decrease in testosterone and andropause, which most people I don't think are aware, actually begins in their 30s. 
um, decreased viability and changes in the sperm, um, decreased testosterone associated with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and abnormally low testosterone levels can cause depression, um, erectile dysfunction, and diminish energy and vitality. Um, and studies do show that low testosterone levels are related to diabetes, osteoporosis, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. So some myths, attitudes, stereotypes, and um, sociocultural influences are on page 543. And I definitely want you to look at that. It's at the bottom of the page going into um, the next page. So, you know, despite the changes in society's views on sexuality and you know, there, it is less taboo. There is still a stigma on older adults and sexuality. Um, there has been significant oppression of LGBTQ communities, those long-term prejudices that, you know, seem to be lifting, but we're still um, moving forward with that. Social cir circumstances. So if someone's a widow or somebody is living with their daughter um, and, maybe they've lost their spouse, it would be really hard for them to, um, to have privacy. So there are also effects of medications, um, alcohol and nicotine. So medications can decrease libido, um, decrease the ability to have an erection. Um, these are important things to ask when people are starting on new meds, you know, have you started on any new meds? You know, could that be the cause of it? Alcohol, alcohol is a depressant. Um, and nicotine can also cause early onset of menopause and cause erectile dysfunction. Some other chronic conditions that can um, put them at risk, COPD, and it's not necessarily the COPD, it's the, what it does to your body that, you know, if you can't breathe and um, your activities de decrease, it would be hard to engage. Um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Arthritis is another one that's sort of like COPD where, you know, your body, your bones and your joints, it's just not physically possible. Risk factors. So gender specific issues. So it could be a BPH or a vaginitis or urethritis. Uh, functional impairments, as I mentioned, arthritis, urinary incontinence, you know, that may make it very uncomfortable. Bowel incontinence, same thing. What are the attitudes and behaviors of the family? Or do they have a caregiver? Um, it's going to affect their sexual wellness if they are dependent on other people to do everything for them. Um, effects of dementia. So sometimes there's no desire. Other times um, people can become extremely hypersexual and very sexually inappropriate. So the functional consequences, loss of reproductive ability, um, changes in response to sex, sexual stimulation, sexual interest and activity, and sexual dysfunction. So for men, it would be erectile dysfunction. For women, dyspareunia, which is pain with intercourse, and vaginismus. So the pathological conditions, so we have STDs. Um, on page 550, um, there's a box, 26-3, um, and it has issues associated with HIV in older adults. I definitely um, want you to look at that as well. So STDs can put people, um, you know, older adults are less aware of the risks, but they do have the same risk factors. So um, it's not necessarily that they're, you know, engaged in risky behaviors. It's just that they don't know to protect themselves. So your nursing assessment, of course, we want to maintain the highest quality of life. You know, look at ourselves and what is our self-assessment about sexual functioning and aging and how are we pushing that on to our patients. Um, assess you know, assessing the sexual function of that older adult, making sure that we're using appropriate terms. If someone has a partner, that's their partner. Um, and we do have a box on 552 that has um, the um, LGBTQ terminology. Cultural considerations are also on page 552 in that same box. I definitely want you to look at that at the bottom, 26-5. Um, and then plicit. So the plicit assessment model is going to be on 553. Definitely need to know that. So the P stands for permission, gaining permission from the client to talk about um, sexual discussions. Um, L and I are going to be providing limited information about sexual function. Um, the two S's are going to be specific suggestions on how to assist them with this. And then the I and T would be intensive therapy. 
So you just want to acknowledge that it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about, you know, be non-judgmental, use open-ended questions with them and try to incorporate sexual wellness with quality of life. It seems to be an easier um, conversation to bring up if, um, because it is a quality of life issue. So try it that way. Assessing risk factors, um, your nursing intervention. So you're gonna teach about aging and sexual wellness, um, trying to promote um, sexuality in, in any type of setting and in particular long-term care settings, as long as um, both participants are able, um, there is no you know, cognitive impairment involved. Any type of disease specific education, so arthritis, um, what ways can we help with all these different um, impairments that may be limiting them. So on 556, you'll see arthritis, cardiovascular disease. Um, I definitely want you to look at that. So women, like I mentioned, we can um, use hormone replacement therapy, but is controversial. There are alternative therapies, um, but there really is no evidence that they're effective. Lifestyle changes can help, diet, exercise, meditation. Um, anytime we can use lubrication, that can help, but you wanna make sure that it's water soluble. So men, we have a bunch of different erectile um, dysfunction meds. They're the P5 inhibitor, um, the Viagra, the Cialis, um, but they do have significant side effects um, and you cannot take them if, um, you cannot prescribe or you know they cannot take them if they are taking nitrates. There is testosterone, re testosterone replacement therapy, but um, it really is lacking in evidence, so it's not recommended. Herbal preparations, again, there's no evidence and we don't know what they're going to affect as far as other medications. There are um, prostheses and um, be cautious with those vasoactive drugs. So evaluation. So you'll know your interventions were effective if they described they, their uh, symptoms have been resolved, they reported increased quality of life and, and they are aware of the safe sex practices and they're um, at a reduced risk. All right, chapter 24, it's gonna be sleep and rest. All right, again, with the learning objectives on the first slide. So let's see, one third of a person's lifetime is spent sleeping. It's hard to picture that. Um, so it is, as you can imagine, it's an essential, essential component of wellness. It's a public concern for people of all ages and it is one of those Healthy People 2020 initiatives because um, not sleeping can affect your quality of life and put you at extreme risk for many different diseases and death. So while you're sleeping, you're actually, um, your metabolic processes are decelerating, your growth hormone is increasing, your body is repairing its tissues, uh, it's synthesizing protein, and you're actually processing cognitive and emotional information. So if you can't do any of those things, you can imagine what life would be like. So Age-related changes, the sleep quantity, so the amount that you're sleeping is decreasing. Your sleep efficiency is diminishing. Your sleep latency is increasing. Your sleep quality changes and your circadian rhythm changes. So, you know, you're spending less time in deep sleep. So efficiency, so sleep efficiency is going to be the percentage of time asleep during the time in bed. So this is gonna decline after the age of 50. Your sleep latency is the time it actually takes you to fall asleep. And it is affected by your sleep efficiency. So we end up with a lot of day napping. So we have a couple different sleep stages, stage one through four, and then followed by REM, which is your dream sleep. So during those non-REM stages, that's when your hormones are being released, your body's relaxing, everything's slowing down and restoring itself. So REM sleep is when we have those certain physiological changes. So you have flaccid muscles, you have an increase in the secretions, uh, your gastric secretions, your cerebral blood flow is increased, your thermoregulating and your blood pressure is going up and down, um, and then you have an increased rate and irregular rhythm of pulse and respirations. So risk factors, um, psychosocial anxiety, worry, you know, that always makes it hard to sleep when you have those issues environmental conditions, maybe there's noise, maybe you're in a hospital, um, maybe it's too hot, um, maybe you, you work 
at night and sleep during the day and the sunlight's coming in. Um, pathological conditions, so let's look at page 512. Um, so we have uh, table 24-2, so there are a slew of different pathological um, conditions, so arthritis, obviously pain, um, COPD, people are in respiratory distress, they, you know, they get anxious overnight, they can't catch their breath, nocturia, you're waking up all night to go to the bathroom, um, dementia, delirium, you can, all of these will make perfect sense to you when you read them, and they'll show you the alteration in sleep. Make sure you look at that. Bioactive substances, so also on page 512, um, the key one being alcohol. So, you know, a decrease in um, drinking can actually increase ins insomnia and that nighttime awakening. So, early morning awakening. So, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'll have a whole bunch of, of alcohol and I'll be able to go to sleep. It actually does the opposite. But if someone has been drinking a lot, and they stop, it actually can, you know, increase their insomnia. Body you know, sort of gets used to it. So functional consequences, insufficient sleep, inefficient sleep, poor sleep quality. Again, these are all um, listed on 511. Um, you can look at that as well. Pathological conditions. So excessive sleepiness. So it's the inability to maintain alertness or vigilance. It's a hallmark symptom um, for people who are suffering with sleep disorders, but it's different from fatigue. Insomnia is that chronic or tran transient sleep disorder, um, poor sleep quality, difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep that was causing people to be tired during the day. And OSA or obstructive sleep apnea is also called sleep disordered breathing. And that's the involuntary cessation of airflow for 10 or more seconds. And you can often have more than five to eight of these in an hour. All right, so OSA. So the treatment of OSA is associated with improved control of AFib. Now remember treatment, so we're, things are gonna get better. Decreased cardiac mortality, improved glycemic control, improved insulin resistance, decreased readmission in heart failure patients to the hospital and reduce blood pressure in patients who have hypertension. So it's really important if someone has um, sleep apnea to, to treat it. Restless legs, RLS, it is often confused um, with uh, PLMS, which is periodic limb movements in sleep. So that is that weird, itching, burning, creepy feeling in your legs. Um, it actually is occurring all the time, but people don't notice it until they're resting or they're not moving as much. So the more you move, the more you don't notice it, um, it's relieved. And it's usually, um, people only notice it you know, in the evening or while they're trying to sleep. So your nursing assessments and interventions, so health promotion and risk factor identification, you can see that on page 515 and, and 518. We have a couple different ass assessments we can use. Um, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale is one of your assessments in um, Canvas under your assessment tools. I definitely want you to look at that. Your nursing interventions, Health education emphasis is going to be on um, alternatives that are non-pharmacological. Anytime we can make those environmental modifications, and there's a there's a list on 518. Um, let's see here, 518, 24-4. So health promotion teaching about sleep. They have a couple different things on here. You know, and when we when I meet with patients um, in the office, you know don't drink caffeine after a certain time of day, um, trying imagery at night, keeping the same schedule, making sure you're, you're cool or cool enough or warm enough, or the lights are the way they're supposed to be, or you're exercising at a certain time of day, or maybe you're taking a bath, all these things um, that can promote sleep. Relaxation, um, sleep restriction, not taking naps during the day so that you're more tired at night. Um, you know, we always want behavioral therapy over pharmacological therapy, hands down in older adults. Um, if someone's in an institutional setting, anytime you can dim the lights, have night lights, um, or limit you know, interventions while people are sleeping, yelling up and down the halls while people are sleeping early at night, that's, you know, we don't wanna do that. Um, adhering with people's bedtime preferences is always gonna be preferred, especially in long-term care. If someone always went to bed at one o'clock in the morning, they're not going to want to go to sleep at nine o'clock at night because you want to put them in bed because that's your schedule for your patients. It just doesn't 
we don't want to do that. Same thing with helping people shower. If someone always took a bath at night, let's bathe them at night. So routines help with incre increasing sleep. Um, Earplugs, um, white noise, and we always suggest um, a blinking phone and smoke detectors for anybody who's going to use earplugs because um, obviously you can't hear anything, you, especially if they're an older adult, um, making sure you have that. Educating about meds and sleep, you know, over-the-counter meds can interfere with daytime function. Any cholinergic um, effects can really cloud um, people's cognitive abilities. So we do not recommend um, NyQuil's, Benadryl's, any kind of PM drugs. They can increase falls and fractures. Hypnotics, so they are only approved for short-term use. Um, you can get refractory insomnia when people become more tolerant to them but um, they are really susceptible to the adverse effects, not only nightmares, but also, like I said, the increased falls and fractures, and you can really see a change in people's cognition that are taking those um, medications. So um, we don't want hypnotics as well. Herbs, same thing, use them with caution. Alcohol is dangerous. Um, it does cause nighttime awakenings. It's completely ineffective. Alcohol is not, should not be used for sleeping. And anytime someone has OSA or um, restless legs or PLMS, anytime we can manage that um, and help them sleep, there are some medications that can assist with that as well. And um, pain management, if it takes two Tylenol for someone to go to sleep, we're all for it. Evaluation, they're gonna report to you that they've slept, they're feeling more refreshed, you're seeing them sleep, maybe they're taking um, more of a, a, a you know, participation in some type of activities if you're in a facility where they can do that um, or you know they they just look more well rested all right last but not least is going to be urinary function which is the real chapter 19. okay so again, we're in the Miller book, so we have learning objectives are gonna be on your second slide. Okay, so the primary function of uh, urinary elimination is going to be to excrete water and chemical wastes. Uh, it's efficient if um, you know the renal blood flow is working, the kidneys are filtering as they should, the urinary tract muscles are functioning as they should, and then you have your voluntary and involuntary mechanisms. Uh, urinary incontinence is going to be involuntary leakage of urine. So age-related changes, again, that affect urinary wellness. Changes in the kidneys, um, they could be degenerative. You have a decrease in blood flow, a decrease in those um, nephrons that help filter. Changes in the bladder and the urinary tract. Um, we're now down to a volume of 350 milliliters in older adults, whereas younger adults have about five to 600 capacity. Additional age-related changes, um, nervous system changes, other regulatory systems, and your thirst perception is down. So myths and misunderstandings. There are, you know, there are some attitudes and lack of knowledge that really does, um, is it a detriment to the older adult related to how their caregivers um, perceive things. So incontinence is not a consequence of aging, but um, the ability to maintain urinary control does depend on um, cognition, uh, sensory and ambulatory abilities, as well as also social, emotional and environmental factors. So, and it is a, a hard thing to deal with. So that influence on the caregivers can negatively affect care. You know, you may assume that one episode of incontinence is ongoing and maybe start putting um, incontinence products on people. Yeah or vice versa, and you don't know about it and they need it. So um, incontinence products um, when used can um, actually allow the development of incontinence. So we don't wanna use it if they don't need it. Um, identify those misperceptions that can interfere with evidence-based nursing care so that you can promote urinary wellness. So fluid intake and dietary factors. A limited fluid intake is um, perceived as maintaining continence can actually have the opposite effect. So if you, people who are, who are taking Lasix often, you know, don't want to go to the bathroom all day and all night, so they'll stop drinking. They can actually put themselves at risk for developing a UTI because the urine is more concentrated and more caustic on the bladder and on the um, ureters. So 
for you. And it actually does the exact opposite. Okay, like I said, um, more concentrated. Um, medication effects, so antihistamines, um, atypical antipsychotics, antihypertensives can also affect urinary wellness and put you at risk for developing urinary incontinence. So it is not a normal part of aging, as I mentioned. Functional impairments, um, so they interfere with the ability for someone to recognize and respond to the urge with enough time to actually get to the bathroom. Um, and also environmental conditions, so stroke, arthritis, um, dementia, delirium, diabetes, Parkinson's, um, COPD, obesity. There's also those gender specific issues. So with men, BPH, you know, typically that nocturia is going to be the first sign for men that they may have something that is really worth um, us investigating. So for a woman, we can have a cystocele. So here's the normal, and here's the cystocele prolapse. And then we have the rectocele. Again, we have a woman here. And then we can, this is normal, and then we can have the rectal prolapse, which is going to be right here. BPH. So the enlarged prostate compresses the urethra, um, which is going to obstruct the vesicle um, neck, which results in decreased urine flow, incomplete emptying, urgency, and frequency. So those effects on renal impairment. Um, impaired absorption of calcium, predisposition to hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, diminished ability to maintain those fluid and electrolyte balances and, and actually correct any type of pH imbalances. Um, diminished renal function contributes to uh, drug interactions and adverse med reactions. Uh, effects on the voiding, so the, the bladder capacity is smaller, so it's not emptying as completely, um, and then it's contracting while it's filling, which is uncomfortable. So you may retain um, the residual, um, and then um, results in nocturia, which can happen for a variety of different things. But So urinary incontinence, again, it's not inevitable with aging. Um, we do have it categorized, so it can be acute, um, and then it can be chronic or persistent. So let's look at this next slide here. Nope, I went too far. Okay, this is definitely one I want you to really look at. So on box 19-2, page 399, I need you to know the differences. So let's look at it closely. So we have urge. Urge, I have a loss of urine right after I have the urge. Oh, I have to go to the bathroom. Urine's out. So that's urge. Stress urinary incontinence. Something stressful on the bladder. So coughing or sneezing, laughing, that is stressful. You're putting pressure on it. Um, mixed urinary incontinence. So that is stress and urge. So it could be one, it could be both. Um, overflow. So overflow is going to be over distension of the bladder. So like BPH, there's an obstruction, it's tight, it's overflowing. It's, there's too much in there, like a cup. Um, and functional would be a functional reason that I have lost my urine. So let's say I have dementia. I just don't, my body doesn't know what it's supposed to do anymore. So there's a functional reason, something that's happening in me that I, it's not actually my bladder or anything wrong with my bladder um, that is causing this loss of urine. Um, urinary tract infections. So um, look at that box, page 400. We have the caudies and then the community dwelling UTI. Um, all right, so your nursing assessment, risk factors, um, potential for incontinence, any types of signs and symptoms that we see, what are their fears and attitudes? We always wanna be addressing all of these things. What are the psychosocial issues? What are the behavioral cues? Um, it is uncomfortable to talk about sometimes, but anytime we can promote health, we need to do that. Um, anytime we can use lab information to help us. And then identifying terminology that's gonna be most comfortable for that patient. Again, it can be a touchy subject, but, um, if you can develop trust and a rapport with them, it's easier to talk about. Challenge any types of myths. Um, look at your attitudes. What are the attitudes of the caregivers? Anytime you can teach about just overall wellness, it's going to be the best thing that you can do. Um, anytime we can provide any type of referrals, they do have really great PT and OT programs that they can help. And they say there's a 40% reduction in incontinence if you can get someone into one of those referral programs. 
Um, we do have pelvic floor exercise um, that we can do. I definitely want you to look at box 19.8 on 406. Um, you can find that pubococcygeal muscle by interrupting the flow of urine. That's one of the most important things on there. And then again, those Kegel exercises. Um, so initiating those training programs. Um, you want people to achieve voluntary control at those two to four hour intervals. So anytime we can have the caregiver directed to get those things in place, um, we do the prompted um, voiding and the time voiding, voiding, especially before bed. Usually in facilities we do upon awakening, before breakfast, after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch, before dinner, after dinner, and before bed. So it ends up being a good amount of time, you know, eight times a day, you know, gets you about three hours using those ap appropriate aids. Anytime, we don't wanna use catheters, but um, commodes, bedpans, anything like that. Um, being knowledgeable about the different medications that are available, um, medications to treat the underlying issue if there is one, or you know, treat incontinence with men and women. We may wanna make sure we use those anticholinergics with caution. They can cause um, urinary retention. And again, promoting caregiver wellness, especially if they are the ones that are in charge for of you know, if they're dependent on them changing, buying supplies for them, products for them. You always want to make sure that you have evaluated your interventions. Um, do they have an understanding of normal urinary function and then things that can put them at risk for incontinence? You know, so like if a patient was to tell you that they would stop drinking earlier in the day to avoid nocturia, that would indicate that you needed to um, do further teaching with them. Looking at those self-care practices that can help them promote their own continence and urinary wellness, and then any type of resources that you can use to help um, get them um, the right supplies that they need is always going to be appropriate. All right, that's it. Thank you.